Give a quick shout out to Universal Yums for sponsoring the channel once again. If you're interested in getting a box with some delicious snacks from some random country around the world, then Universal Yums is for you. They sent me this box and it was just jammed full of absolutely delicious treats. Full chocolate bars, full wafer bars. It was delicious. If you want to get one for yourself and support the channel in the process, check out the link at the top of the description. Thanks again, everyone. Dr. Teasdale had occasion to attend the condemned man once or twice during the week before his execution, and found him, as is often the case, when his last hope of life has vanished. Quiet and perfectly resigned to his fate, and not seeming to look forward with any dread to the morning that each hour that passed brought nearer and nearer. The bitterness of death appeared to be over for him. It was done when he was told that his appeal was refused. But for those days, while hope was not yet quite abandoned, the wretched man had drunk of death daily. In all his experience, the doctor had never seen a man so wildly, passionately tenacious of life, nor one so strongly knit to this material world by the sheer animal lust of living. And then the news that hope could no longer be entertained was told him, and his spirit passed out of the grip of that agony of torture and suspense, and accepted the inevitable with indifference. Yet the change was so extraordinary that it seemed to the doctor rather that the news had completely stunned his powers of feeling, and he was below the numbed surface, still knit into material things as strongly as ever. He'd fainted when the result was told him, and Dr. Teasdale had been called in to attend him. But the fit was but transient, and he came out of it into full consciousness of what had happened. The murder had been a deed of peculiar horror, and there was nothing of sympathy in the mind of the public toward the perpetrator. Charles Linkworth, who now lay under capital sentence, was the keeper of a small stationery store in Sheffield, and there lived with him his wife, and mother. The latter was the victim of his atrocious crime, the motive of it being to get possession of the sum of 500 pounds, which was this woman's property. Linkworth, as it came out at the trial, was in debt to the extent of 100 pounds at the time. During his wife's absence from home on a visit to relations, he strangled his mother during the night, buried the body in a small back garden of his house. On his wife's return, he had a sufficiently plausible tale to account for the elder Mrs. Linkworth's disappearance, for there had been constant jarrings and bickerings between him and his mother for the last year or two, and she had more than once threatened to withdraw herself and the eight shillings a week which she contributed to household expenses and purchase an annuity with her money. It was true, also, that during the younger Mrs. Linkworth's absence from home, mother and son had had a violent quarrel arising originally from some trivial point in household management, and that in the consequence of this, she had actually drawn her money out of the bank, intended to leave Sheffield the next day and settle in London where she had friends. That evening she told him this, and during the night, he killed her. His next step before his wife's return was logical and sound. He packed up all his mother's possessions and took them to the station, from which he saw them dispatched to town by passenger train, and in the evening he asked several friends into supper and told them of his mother's departure. He did not, logically also, and in accordance with that they probably already knew, feign regret, but said that he and she had never got on well together and that the cause of peace and quietness was furthered by her going. He told the same story to his wife on her return, identical in every detail, adding, however, that the quarrel had been a violent one, and that his mother had not even left him her address. This again was wisely thought of. It would prevent his wife from writing to her. She appeared to accept his story completely. Indeed, there was nothing strange or suspicious about it. For a while, he behaved with the composure and astuteness which most criminals possess up to a certain point, the lack of which, after that, is generally the cause of their detection. He did not, for instance, immediately pay off his debt, but 
took into his house a young man as lodger who occupied his mother's room, and he dismissed the assistant in his shop and did the entire serving himself. This gave the impression of economy, and at the same time he openly spoke of the great improvement in his trade, and not till a month had passed did he cash any of the banknotes which he'd found in a locked drawer in his mother's room. And he changed the two notes of fifty pounds and paid off his creditors. At that point his astuteness and composure failed him. He opened a deposit account at a local bank with four more 50-pound notes instead of being patient and increasing his balance at the savings bank pound by pound, and he got uneasy about that which he had buried deep enough for security in the back garden. Thinking to render himself safer in this regard, he ordered a cartload of slag and stone fragments, and with the help of his lodger, employed the summer evenings when work was over in building a sort of rockery over the spot. Then came the chance circumstance which really set match to this dangerous train. There was a fire in the lost luggage office at King Cross Station, from which he ought to have claimed his mother's property, and one of the two boxes was partially burned. The company was liable for compensation, and his mother's name was on her linen, and a letter with the Sheffield address on it led to the arrival of a purely official and formal notice stating that the company were prepared to consider claims. It was directed to Mrs. Linkworth's and Charles Linkworth's wife, received it, and read it. It seemed a sufficiently harmless document, but it was endorsed with his death warrant, for he could give no explanation at all of the fact of the boxes still lying at King Cross Station, beyond suggesting that some accident had happened to his mother. Clearly, he had to put the matter into the hands of the police with a view to tracing her movements, and if it proved that she was dead, claiming her property which she had already drawn out of the bank. Such at least was the course urged on him by his wife and lodger, in whose presence the communication from the railway officials was read out, and it was impossible to refuse to take it. And then the silent, uncreaking machinery of justice, characteristic of England, began to move forward. Quiet men lounged about Smith Street, visited banks, observed the supposed increase in trade, and from a house nearby looked into the garden where ferns were already flourishing on the rockery. Then came the arrest and the trial, which did not last very long, and on a certain Saturday night, the verdict. Smart women in large hats had made the court bright with color, and in all the crowd there was not one who felt any sympathy with the young, athletic-looking man who was condemned. Many of the audience were elderly and respectable mothers, and the crime had been an outrage on motherhood, and they listened to the unfolding of the flawless evidence with strong approval. They thrilled a little when the judge put that awful and ludicrous little black cap and spoke a sentence appointed by God. Linkworth went to pay the penalty for the atrocious deed, which no one who had heard the evidence could possibly doubt that he had done with the same indifference as he'd marked his entire demeanor since he knew his appeal had failed. The prison chaplain who had attended him had done his utmost to get him to confess, but his efforts had been quite ineffectual, and to the last he asserted, though without protestation, his innocence. On a bright September morning, when the sun shone warm on the terrible little procession that crossed the prison yard to the shed where was erected the apparatus of death, justice was done, and Dr. Teasdale was satisfied that life was immediately extinct. He'd been present on the scaffold, had watched the bolt drawn, and the hooded and pendant figure drop to the pit. He'd heard the chunk and creak of the rope as the sudden weight came onto it, and looking down he had seen the queer twitchings of the hanged body. They had lasted but a second, for the execution had been perfectly satisfactory. An hour later, he made the post-mortem examination and found that his view had been correct. The vertebrae of the spine had been broken at the neck, and death must have been absolutely instantaneous. It was hardly necessary even to make that little piece of dissection that provided this, but for the sake of form, he did so. At that moment, he had a very curious and vivid mental impression of that spirit of the dead man that was close beside him, as if it still dwelt in the broken habitation of its body. 
there was no question that the body was dead. It had been dead an hour. Then followed another little circumstance that at the first seemed insignificant, though curious also. One of the warders entered and asked if the rope which had been used an hour ago and was the hangman's perquisite had by mistake been brought into the mortuary with the body. But there was no trace of it, and it seemed to have vanished altogether, though it a singular thing to be lost, it was not here, it was not on the scaffold. And though the disappearance was of no particular moment, it was quite inexplicable. Dr. Teasdale was a bachelor and a man of independent means and lived in a tall, windowed, and commodious house in Bedford Square, where a plain cook of surpassing excellence looked after his food and her husband, his person. There was no need for him to practice a profession at all, and he performed his work at the prison for the sake of the study of the minds of criminals. Most crime, the transgression, that is, of the rule of conduct which the human race has framed for the sake of its own preservation, he held to be either the result of some abnormality of the brain or of starvation. Crimes of theft, for instance, he would by no means refer to one head. Often it is true they were the result of actual want, but more often dictated by some obscure disease of the brain. In marked cases, it was labeled as kleptomania but he was convinced there were many others which did not fall directly under the dictation of physical need. More especially was the case where the crime in question involved also some deed of violence, and he mentally placed underneath this heading as he went home that evening the criminal at whose last moments he had been present that morning. The crime had been abominable, and the need of money not so very pressing, and the very abomination and the unnaturalness of the murder inclined him to consider the murderer as lunatic rather than criminal. He had been, as far as was known, a man of quiet and kindly disposition, a good husband, a sociable neighbor. And then he had committed a crime, just one, which put him outside all pales. So monstrous a deed, whether perpetrated by a sane man or a mad one, was intolerable. There was no use for the doer, if on this planet at all. But somehow the doctor felt that he would have been more at one with the execution of justice if the dead man had confessed it. It was morally certain that he was guilty, but he wished that when there was no longer any hope for him, he had endorsed the verdict himself. He dined alone that evening, and after dinner he sat in his study which adjoined the dining room, and feeling disinclined to read, sat in his great red chair opposite the fireplace and let his mind graze where it would. At once, almost, it went back to the curious sensation he'd experienced that morning, a feeling that spirit of Linkworth was present in the mortuary, though life had been extinct for an hour. It was not the first time, especially in cases of sudden death, that he'd felt a similar conviction, though perhaps it had never been quite so unmistakable as it had been today. Yet the feeling to his mind was quite probably formed on a natural and physical truth. The spirit, it may be remarked that he was a believer in the doctrine of future life and the non-extinction of the soul when the death of the body, was very likely unable or unwilling to quit at once and altogether the earthly habitation. Very likely it lingered there, earthbound for a while. In his leisure hours, Dr. Teasdale was a considerable student of the occult, for like most advanced and proficient physicians, he clearly recognized how narrow was the boundary of separation between soul and body, how tremendous the influence of the intangible was over material things, and it presented no difficulty to his mind that a disembodied spirit should be able to communicate directly with those who still were bounded by the finite and material. His meditations, which were beginning to group themselves into definite sequence, were interrupted at this moment. On his desk near at hand stood his telephone, and the bell rang not with its usual metallic insistence, but very faintly as if the current was weak or the mechanism impaired. However, it certainly was ringing, and he got up and took the combined ear and mouthpiece off its hook. Yes, yes, he said. Who is it? There was a whisper in reply, almost inaudible and quite unintelligible. 
I can't hear you, he said. Again the whisper sounded, but with no greater distinctness. Then it ceased altogether. He stood there for some half minute or so, waiting for it to be renewed, but beyond the usual chuckling and croaking which showed, however, that he was in communication with some other instrument, there was silence. Then he replaced the receiver, rang up the exchange, and gave his number. Can you tell me what number rang me up just now? he asked. There was a short pause, then it was given to him. It was the number of the prison where he was a doctor. Put me to it, please, he said. This was done. You bring me just now? He sent down the tube. Yes, I'm Dr. Teasdale. What is it? I could not hear what she said. The voice came back quite clear and intelligible. Some mistake, sir, it said. We haven't rung you up. But the exchange tells me you did, three minutes ago. Mistake of the exchange, sir, said the voice. Hmm. Very odd. Well, good night, Warder Draycott, isn't it? Yes, sir. Good night, sir. Dr. Teasdale went back into his big armchair, still less inclined to read. He let his thoughts wander on for a while without giving them definitive direction, but... Ever and again, his mind kept coming back to that strange little incident of the telephone. Often and often, he'd been rung up by some mistake. Often and often, he'd been put on the wrong number by the exchange, but there was something in this very subdued ringing of the telephone bell and the unintelligible whisperings at the other end that suggested a very curious train of reflection in his mind. And soon he found himself pacing up and down his room with his thoughts eagerly feeding on a most unusual pasture. But it's impossible, he said out loud. He went down as usual to the prison next morning, and once again he was strangely beset with the feeling that there was some unseen presence there. He had before now had some odd physical experiences and knew that he was a sensitive, one that is who is capable under certain circumstances of receiving supernormal impressions and of having glimpses of the unseen world that lies about us. And this morning the presence of which he was conscious was that of the man who had been executed yesterday morning. It was local, and he felt it most strongly in the little prison yard and as he passed the door to the condemned cell. So strong was it there that he would not have been surprised that the figure of the man had been visible to him, and as he passed through the door at the end of the passage, he turned round, actually expecting to see it. All the time, too, he was aware of a profound horror at his heart. This unseen presence strangely disturbed him, and the poor soul, he felt, wanted something done for it. Not for a moment did he doubt that this impression of his was objective, it was no imaginative phantom of his own invention that made itself so real. The spirit of Linkworth was there. He passed into the infirmary and for a couple of hours busied himself with his work. But all the time he was aware that the same invisible presence was near him, though its force was manifestly less here than in those places which had been more intimately associated with the man. Finally, before he left, in order to test his theory, he looked into the execution shed. The next moment, with a face suddenly stricken pale, he came out again, closing the door hastily. At the top of the steps stood a figure hooded and pinioned, but hazy of outline, and only faintly visible. But it was visible. There was no mistake about it. Dr. Teasdale was a man of good nerve, and he recovered himself almost immediately, ashamed of his temporary panic. The terror that had blanched his face was chiefly on the effect of the startled nerves, not a terrified heart, and yet deeply interested as he was in physical phenomena, he could not command himself sufficiently to go back there. Or, rather, he commanded himself, but his muscles refused to act on the message. 
If this poor earthbound spirit had any communication to make to him, he certainly much preferred that it should be made at a distance. As far as he could understand, its range was circumscribed. It haunted the prison yard, the condemned cell, the execution shed, and it was more faintly felt in the infirmary. Then a further point suggested itself to his mind, and he went back to his room and sent for Ward Draycott, who had answered him on the telephone last night. You are quite sure, he asked, that nobody rang me up last night, just before I rang you up. There was a certain hesitation in the man's manner, which the doctor noticed. I, I, I don't see how that could be possible, sir, he said. I'd been sitting close by the telephone for half an hour before and again before that. I must have seen him if anyone had been to the instrument. And you saw no one, said the doctor with a slight emphasis. The man became more markedly ill at ease. No, sir. I saw no one, he said with the same emphasis. Dr. Teasdale looked away from him. But you had perhaps the impression that there was someone there, he asked, carelessly as if it were a point of no interest. Clearly Warder Draycott had something on his mind, which he found it hard to speak of. Well, sir, if you put it like that, he began. But you would tell me I was half asleep or had eaten something that disagreed with me at supper. The doctor dropped his careless manner. I should do nothing of the kind he said, any more than you would tell me that I dropped asleep last night when I heard my telephone bell ring. Mind you, Draycott, it did not ring as usual. I could only just hear it ringing, though it was close to me, and I could only hear a whisper when I put my ear to it. But when you spoke, I heard you quite distinctly. Now, I believe there was something, somebody, at the end of this telephone. You were here, and though you saw no one, you too felt there was someone there. The man nodded. I'm not a nervous man, sir, he said, and I don't deal in fancies. There was something in there. It was hovering about the instrument, and it wasn't the wind, because there wasn't a breath of wind stirring, and the night was warm. And I shut the window to make certain, but it went about the room, sir, for an hour or more. It rustled the leaves of the telephone book. It ruffled my hair when it came close to me, and it was bitter cold, sir. The doctor looked him straight in the face. Did it remind you of what had been done yesterday morning? He asked suddenly. Again, the man hesitated. Yes, sir, he said at length. Convict Charles Linkworth. Dr. Teasdale nodded reassuringly. That's it, he said. Now, are you on duty tonight? Yes, sir. Wish I wasn't. I know how you feel. I have felt exactly the same myself. Now, whatever this is, it seems to want to communicate with me. By the way, did you have any disturbance in the prison last night? Yes, sir. There was... Half a dozen men who had the nightmare, yelling and screaming, and quiet men too, usually. It happens sometimes, the night after an execution. I've known it before, though nothing like what it saw last night. I see. Now, if this, this thing you can't see, wants to get at the telephone again tonight, give it every chance. It will probably come at around the same time. I can't tell you why, but that's usually what happens. So unless you must, don't be in this room where the telephone is, just for an hour to give it plenty of time between half past nine and half past ten. Supposing I am rung up, I will, when it has finished, ring you up to make sure that I was not being called in in the usual way. And there's nothing to be afraid of, sir? Asked the man. Dr. Teasdale remembered his own moment of terror this morning, but he spoke quite sincerely. I'm sure there is nothing to be afraid of, he said reassuringly. Dr. Teasdale had a dinner engagement that night, which he broke, and was sitting alone in his study by half-past nine. 
In the present state of human ignorance as to the law which governs the movements of spirits severed from the body, he cannot tell the warder why it was their visits are so often periodic, timed to punctuality according to our scheme of ours, but in scenes of tabulated instances of the appearance of revenants, especially if the soul was in sore need of help, as might be the case here. He found that they came at the same hour of day or night. As the rule, too, their power of making themselves seen or heard or felt grew greater for some little time while after death, subsequently growing weaker as they became less earthbound, or often after that ceasing altogether, and he was prepared tonight for a less indistinct impression. The spirit apparently for the early hours of its disembodiment is weak like a moth newly broken out of its chrysalis. And then suddenly the telephone bell rang, not so faintly as the night before, but still not its ordinary imperative tone. Dr. Teasdale instantly got up, put the receiver to his ear, and what he heard was heartbroken sobbing, strong spasms that seemed to tear the weeper. He waited for a little before speaking, himself cold with some nameless fear, and it profoundly moved to help if he was able. Yes, yes, he said at length, hearing his own voice tremble. I'm Dr. Teasdale. What can I do for you? And who are you? he added, though he felt that it was a needless question. Slowly, the sobbing died down. The whispers took its place still broken by crying. I want to tell you, sir. I want to tell. I must tell. Yes, tell me, what is it? said the doctor. No, not you. Another gentleman used to come see me. Will you speak to him what I say to you? I can't make him hear me or see me. Who are you? asked Dr. Teasdale suddenly. Charles Linkworth, I thought you knew. I'm very miserable. I can't leave the prison. It's cold. Will you send for the other gentleman? Do you mean the chaplain? asked Dr. Teasdale. Yes, the chaplain. He read the service when I went across the yard yesterday. I shan't be so miserable when I have told. The doctor hesitated a moment. There was a strange story that he would have to tell Mr. Dawkins, the prison chaplain, that the other end of the telephone was the spirit of the man executed yesterday, and yet he soberly believed that it was so, that this unhappy spirit was in misery and wanted to tell. There was no need to ask what he wanted to tell. Yes. I will ask him to come here, he said at length. Thank you, sir, a thousand times. You'll make him come, won't you? The voice was growing fainter. It must be tomorrow night, it said. I can't speak longer now. I have to go see. Oh, my God, my God. The sobs broke out afresh, sounding fainter and fainter, but it was in a frenzy of terrified interest that Dr. Teasdale spoke. To see what? he cried. Tell me what you were doing. What is happening to you? I can't tell you. I mayn't tell you, said the voice very faint. That is part. And it died away altogether. Dr. Teasdale waited a little but there was no further sound of any kind except the chuckling and croaking of the instrument. He put the receiver onto its hook again and then became aware for the first time that his forehead was streaming with some cold dew of horror. His ears sang, his heart beat very quick and faint, and he sat down to recover himself. Once or twice he asked himself if it was possible that some terrible joke was being played on him, but he knew that could not be so. He felt perfectly sure that he had been speaking with a soul in torment of contrition for the terrible and irredeemable act it had committed. It was no delusion of his senses either. 
Here in his comfortable room of his Bentford Square with London cheerfully roaring round him, he had spoken with the spirit of Charles Linkworth. But he had no time, nor indeed inclination, for somehow his soul sat shuddering within him to indulge in meditation. First of all, he rang the prison. Warder Draycott? he asked. There was a perceptible tremor in the man's voice as he answered. Yes, sir. Is it Dr. Teasdale? Yes. Has anything happened here with you? Twice it seemed that the man tried to speak and could not. At the third attempt, his words came. Yes, sir. He's been here. So I'm going to the room where the telephone is. Ah, did you speak to him? No, sir. I sweated and I prayed. And there's half a dozen men as have been screaming in their sleep tonight. But it's quiet again now. I think he's gone into the execution shed. Yes, well, there will be no more disturbance now. By the way, please give me Mr. Dawkins' home address. This was given him, and Dr. Teasdale proceeded to write to the chaplain asking him to dine with him the following night. But suddenly he found that he could not write at his accustomed desk with the telephone standing close to him, and he went upstairs to the drawing room, which he seldom used, except when he entertained his friends. There he recaptured the serenity of his nerves and could control his hand. The note simply asked Mr. Dawkins to dine with him the next night when he wished to tell him a very strange history and ask for his help. Even if you do have any other engagement, he concluded, I seriously request you to give it up. Tonight I did the same. I should bitterly have regretted if I had not. Next night, accordingly, the two sat at their dinner in the doctor's dining room, and when they were left to their cigarettes and coffee, the doctor spoke. You must not think me mad, my dear Dawkins, he said, when you hear what I've got to tell you. Mr. Dawkins laughed. I will certainly promise not to do that, he said. Good. Last night, and the night before, a little later in the evening than this, I spoke through the telephone with the spirit of a man we saw executed two days ago. Charles Linkworth. The chaplain did not laugh. He pushed back his chair, looking annoyed. Teasdale, he said. Is it to tell me this, I don't want to be rude, but this boogie tale that... You've brought me here this evening? Yes. You've not heard half of it. He asked me last night to get a hold of you. He wants to tell you something. We can guess, I think, what it is. Dawkins got up. Please let me hear no more of it, he said. The dead do not return. In what state or under what condition they exist has not been revealed to us. But they've done with all material things. "'But I must tell you more,' said the doctor. Two nights ago I was rung up, but very faintly, and could only hear whispers. "'I instantly inquired where the call had come from, and was told that it came from the prison. "'I rang up the prison, and Warder Draycott told me that nobody had rung me. "'He, too, was conscious of a presence.' "'I think that man drinks,' said Dawkins, sharply. "'The doctor paused a moment.' My dear fellow, you should not say that sort of thing, he said. He's one of the steadiest men we have, and if he drinks, why not I also? The chaplain sat down again. You must forgive me, he said, but I can't go into this. These are dangerous matters to meddle with. Besides, how do you know it's not a hoax? Played by whom, said the doctor. Hank? telephone bell suddenly rang. It was clearly audible to the doctor. Don't you hear it? He said. Hear what? The telephone bell ringing. I hear no ringing, said the chaplain, rather angrily. There is no bell ringing. The doctor did not answer, but went through into his study and turned on the lights. Then he took the receiver and mouthpiece off its hook. Yes, 
he said in a voice that trembled. Who is it? Yes, Mr. Dawkins is here. I'll try and get him to speak to you. He went back into the other room. Dawkins, he said, there is a soul in agony. I pray you to listen. For God's sake, come and listen. The chaplain hesitated a moment. As you will, he said. He took up the receiver and put it to his ear. I'm Mr. Dawkins, he said. He waited. I can hear nothing whatever, he said at length. Oh, there was something there, the faintest whisper. Ah, try to hear, try to hear, said the doctor. Again the chaplain listened. Suddenly he laid the instrument down, frowning. Something, somebody said, I killed her. I confess it. I want to be forgiven. It's a hoax, my dear Teasdale. Somebody knowing your spiritualistic leanings is playing a very grim joke on you. I, I can't believe it. Dr. Teasdale took up the receiver. I'm Dr. Teasdale, he said. Can you give Mr. Dawkins some sign that it is you? Then he laid it down again. He says he thinks he can, he said. We must wait. The evening was again very warm, and the window into the paved yard at the back of the house was open. For five minutes or so, the men stood in silence, waiting, and nothing happened. Then the chaplain spoke. I think that is sufficiently conclusive, he said. Even as he spoke, a very cold draught of air suddenly blew into the room, making the papers on the desk rustle. Dr. Teasdale went to the window and closed it. Did you feel that? he asked. Yes, a breath of air. Chilly. Once again in the closed room, it stirred again. And did you feel that? asked the doctor. The chaplain nodded. He felt his heart hammering in his throat suddenly. Defend us from an all peril and danger of this coming night, he exclaimed. Something is coming, said the doctor. As he spoke, it came. In the center of the room, not three yards away from them, stood the figure of a man with his head bent over to his shoulder so that the face was not visible. Then he took his head in both hands and raised it like a weight and looked at them in the face. The eyes and tongue protruded. A livid mark was round the neck. Then there came a sharp rattle on the boards of the floor, and the figure was no longer there, but on the floor, and there lay a new rope. For a long while, neither spoke. The sweat poured off the doctor's face, and the chaplain's white lips whispered prayers. And by a huge effort, the doctor pulled himself together. He pointed at the rope. It's been missing since the execution, he said. Then again the telephone bell rang. This time the chaplain needed no prompting. He went to it at once and the ringing ceased. For a while he listened in silence. Charles Linkworth, he said at length, in the sight of God, in whose presence you stand, are you truly sorry for your sin? Some answer, inaudible to the doctor, came and the chaplain closed his eyes. And Dr. Teasdale knelt as he heard the words of absolution. At the close, there was a silence again. I can hear nothing more, said the chaplain, replacing the receiver. Presently, the doctor's manservant came in with a tray of spirits and siphon. Dr. Teasdale pointed without looking to where the apparition had been. Take the rope that is there and burn it, Parker he said. It had been a disastrous afternoon. Rain had streamed incessantly from a low gray sky and the road was of the vilest description. There were sections consisting of sharp flints newly laid down and not yet rolled into amenity, 
and the stretches in between were worn into deep ruts and bouncing holes so that it was impossible anywhere to travel at even a moderate speed. Twice we had punctured, and now, as the stormy dusk began to fall, something went wrong with the engine, and after crawling on for a hundred yards or so, we stopped. My driver, after a short investigation, told me that there was a half hour's tinkering to be done, and after that we might, with luck, trundle along in a leisurely manner and hope eventually to arrive at Crowthorpe, which was the proposed destination. We'd come, when this stoppage occurred, to a crossroad. Through the driving rain, I could see on the right a great church in front of a huddle of houses. A consultation of the map seemed to indicate that this was the village of Riddington. The guidebook added the information that Riddington possessed a hotel, and the signpost at the corner endorsed them both. To the right along the main road into which we had just struck was Crowthorpe. Fifteen miles away and straight in front of us half a mile distant was the hotel. The decision was not difficult. There was no reason why I should get to Crowthorpe tonight instead of tomorrow, for the friend whom I was to meet there would not arrive until next afternoon, and it was surely better to limp half a mile with an engine than to attempt fifteen on this inclement evening. We'll spend the night here, I said to my chauffeur. The road dips downhill, and it's only half a mile to the hotel. I dare say we get there without using the engine at all. Let's try, anyhow. We hooted and crossed the main road and began to slide very slowly down a narrow street. It was impossible to see much, but on either side there were little houses with lights gleaming through blinds or with blinds still undrawn, revealing cozy interiors. Then the incline grew steeper, and close in front of us I saw masts against the sheet of water that appeared to stretch unbroken into the rain-shrouded gloom of the gathering night. Riddington, then, must be on the open sea, though how it came about that boats should be tied up to an open quay wall was a puzzle, but perhaps there was some jetty, invisible in the darkness, which protected them. I heard the chauffeur switch on his engine as we made a sharp turn to the left, and we passed below a long row of lighted windows, shining out onto a rather narrow road on the right edge of which the water lapped. Again, he turned sharply to the left, described a half-circle on crunching gravel, and went up to the door to the hotel. There was a room for me, there was a garage, and there was a room for him, and dinner had not long begun. Among the little excitements and surprises of travel, there is none more delightful than that of walking into a new place at which one has arrived after nightfall on the previous evening. The mind has received a few hints and dusky impressions, and probably during sleep it has juggled with these, constructing them into some sort of coherent whole, and next morning its anticipations are put to the proof. Usually the eye has seen more than it has consciously registered, and the brain has fitted together as in a manner of a jigsaw puzzle a very fair presentment of its immediate surroundings. When I woke next morning, a brilliantly sunny sky looked in at my windows. There was no sound of wind or of breaking waves, and before getting up and verifying my impressions of the night before, I lay in and washed in my imagined picture. In front of my windows there would be a narrow roadway, bordered by the quay wall. There would be a breakwater, forming a harbor for the boats that lay at anchor there, and away, away into the horizon would stretch an expanse of still and glittering sea. I ran over these points in my mind. They seemed an inevitable inference of the glimpses of the night before and then. Assured of my correctness, I got out of bed and went to the window. I have never experienced so complete a surprise. There was no harbor, there was no breakwater, and there was no sea. A very narrow channel, three quarters choked with sandbanks on which now rested the boats whose masts I'd seen in the previous evening, ran parallel to the road, and then turned at right angles and went off into the distance. Otherwise, no water of any sort was visible. Right and left and in front stretched the limitless expanse of shining grasses with tufts of shrubbery growth and great patches of purple sea lavender. Beyond were tawny sandbanks and further yet a line of shingle and scrub and sand dunes, but the sea which I had expected to fill the whole circle of the visible world till it met the sky on the horizon had totally disappeared. 
After the first surprise of this colossal conjuring trick was over, I dressed quickly in order to ascertain from local authorities how it was done. Unless some hallucination had poisoned my perceptive faculties, there must be an explanation of this total disappearance, alternately of sea and land, and the key, when supplied, was simple enough. That line of shingle and scrub and sand dunes on the horizon was a peninsula running for four or five miles parallel with the land, forming the true beach, and it enclosed this vast basin of sandbanks and mud banks and level lavender-covered marsh, which was submerged at high tide and made an estuary. At low tide, it was altogether empty, but for the stream that struggled out through various channels to the mouth of it two miles away to the left, and there was easy passage across it for a man who carried his shoes and stockings to the far sand dunes and beaches which terminated at Ridging Point, while at high tide, you could sail out from the quay just in front of the hotel and be landed there. The tide would be out of the estuary for five or six hours yet. I could spend the morning on the beach or, taking my lunch, walk out to the point and be back before the returning waters rendered the channel impassable. There was a good bathing on the beach, and there was a colony of terns who nested there. Already as I ate my breakfast at a table in the window overlooking the marsh, the spell and attraction of it had begun to work. It was so immense and so empty, it had the allure of a desert about it, with none of the desert's intolerable monotony for companies of chiding gulls hovered over it, and I could hear the pipe of red shank and the babble of curlews. I was due to meet Matt Granger in Cawthorpe that evening, but if I went I knew that I should persuade him to come back to Riddington, and from my knowledge of him I was aware that he would feel the spell of the place not less potent than I. So having ascertained that there was a room for him here, I wrote him a note saying that I'd found the most amazing place in the world and told my chauffeur to take the car into Cawthorpe to meet the train that afternoon and bring him here. And with that, a perfectly clear concise, I set off with a towel and a packet of lunch in my pocket to explore vaguely and goallessly that beckoning immensity of lavender-covered, bird-haunted expanse. My way, as pointed out to me, led first along a sea bank which defended the drained pasture land of the right of it from the high tides, and at the corner of that I struck into the basin of the estuary. A contour line of jet sam, withered grass, strands of seaweed, and the bleached shells of little crabs showed where the last tide had reached its height, and inside it the marsh growth was still wet. Then came a stretch of mud and pebbles, and presently I was wading through the stream that flowed down the sea. Beyond that were the banks of ribbed sand, swept by the incoming tides, and soon I regained the wide green marshes on the further side, beyond which was the bar of shingle that fringed the sea. I paused as I reshod myself. There was not a sign of any living human being within sight, but I had never found myself in so exhilarating a solitude. Right and left were spread the lawns of sea lavender, starred with pink tufts of thrift and thickets of sueda bushes. Here and there were pools left in depressions of the ground by retreated tide, and here were patches of smooth black mud, of which grew like little spikes of milky green asparagus, a crop of glass wart, and all these happy vegetables flourished in sunshine or rain or the salt of the flooding tides with impartial amphibiousness. Overhead was the immense arc of the sky across which flew now a flight of duck, hurrying with necks outstretched, and now a lonely black-billed gull, flapping his ponderous way seawards. Curlews were bubbling in red shank and ringed plover flooding, and now as I trudged up the shingle bank at the bottom of which the marsh came to an end, the sea, blue and waveless, lay stretched and sleeping, bordered by a strip of sand on which far off a mirage hovered. But from end to end of it, as far as the eye could see, there was no sign of human presence. I bathed and basked on the hot beach, walked along for half a mile, and then struck back across the shingle into the marsh. And then, with a pang of disappointment, I saw the first evidence of the intrusion of man in this paradise of solitude. For on a stony spit of ground that ran like some great rib into the amphibious meadows, there stood a small square house built of brick with a tall flagstaff set up in front of it. 
It had not caught my eye before, and it seemed an unwarrantable invasion of the emptiness. For perhaps it was not so gross an infringement of it as it appeared, for it wore an indefinable look of desertion, as if man had attempted to domesticate himself here and had failed. As I approached, this impression increased, for the chimney was smokeless, and the closed windows were dim with the film of salt air, and the threshold of the closed door was patched with lichen and strewn with debris of withered grasses. I walked twice around it, decided that it was certainly uninhabited, and finally, leaning against the sun-baked wall, ate my lunch. The glitter and heat of the day were at their height. Warmed and exercised and invigorated by my bathe, I felt strung to the supreme pitch of physical well-being, and my mind, quite vacant except for those felicitous impressions followed by the example of my body and basked in an unclouded content. And I suppose by a sense of the lucreate and luxury of contrasts, it began to picture to itself in order to accentuate these blissful conditions what this sunlit solitude would be like when some November night began to close in underneath a low gray sky and a driving storm of sleet. Its solitariness would be turned into an abominable destination if from some unconjecturable cause one was forced to spend the night here how the mind would long for any companionship, how sinister would become the calling of birds, how weird the whistle of the wind around the cavern of this abandoned habitation. Or would it just be the other way about, and would only be longing to be assured that the seeming solitude was real, and that no invisible but encroaching presence soon to be made manifest was creeping nearer under the cover of dusk, and be shuddering to think that the wail of the wind was not only the wind, but the cry of some discarnate being, and that it was not the curlews that made melancholy piping. By degrees the edge of thought grew blunt and melted into inconsequent imaginings, and I fell asleep. I woke with a start from the trouble of a dream that faded with waking, but felt sure that some noise close at hand had aroused me. And then it came again, It was the footfall of someone moving about inside the deserted house, against the wall of which my back was propped. Up and down it went, then paused and began again. It was like that of a man who waited with impatience for some expected arrival. I noticed also that the footfall had an irregular beat, as if the walker went with a limp. And in a minute or two, the sound ceased altogether. An odd sense of uneasiness came over me, for I had been so certain that the house was uninhabited. And turning my head, I noticed that the wall just above me was a window, and the notion, wholly irrational and unfounded, entered my mind that the man inside who tramped was watching me from it. When once the idea got a hold of me, it became impossible to sit there in peace any more, and I got up and shoveled into my knapsack my towel and the remains of my meal. I walked a little further down the spit of land which ran out into the marsh, and turning, looked at the house again, and again to my eyes it seemed absolutely deserted. But after all, it was no concern of mine, and I proceeded on my walk, determining to inquire casually on my return to the hotel who it was that lived in so hermetical a place, and for the present dismissed the matter from my mind. It was some three hours later that I found myself opposite the house again. After a long, wandering walk, I saw that by making an only slightly longer detour, I could pass close to the house again, and I knew that the sound of those footsteps within it had raised in me a curiosity that I wanted to satisfy. And then, even as I paused, I saw that a man was standing by the door. How he came there I had no idea, for the moment before he had not been there, and he must have come out of the house. He was looking down the path that led to the marsh, shielding his eyes against the sun, and presently he took a step or two forward, and he dragged his left leg as he walked, limping heavily. It was with his step then which I had heard within, and any mystery about the matter was of my own making. I therefore took the shorter path and got back to the hotel to find that Jack Granger had just arrived. 
We went out again in the gleam of sunset and watched the tide sweeping in and pouring up the dikes until again the great conjuring trick was accomplished and the stretch of marsh with its fields of sea lavender was a sheet of shining water. Far away across it stood the house by which I had lunched and just as we turned, Jack pointed to it. That's a queer place for a house, he said. Suppose no one lives there. Yes, someone does said I. I saw him today. I'm going to ask the hotel porter who he is. The result of this inquiry was unexpected. No, the house has been uninhabited for several years. It used to be a watch house from which the Coast Guard signaled if there was a ship in distress and the lifeboat went out from there. But now the lifeboat and the Coast Guards are at the end of the point. Then who's the man I saw walking about there and heard inside the house? He looked at me, I thought queerly. I don't know who that could be, he said. There's no man about here to my knowledge. The effect on Jack of the marshes and their gorgeous emptiness of the sun and the sea was precisely what I'd anticipated. He vowed that any day spent anywhere than on these beaches and fields of sea lavender was a day wasted, and proposed that the tour, of which the main object had originally been the golf links of Norfolk, should be, for the present, cancelled. In particular, it was the birds of this long, solitary headland that enchanted him. After all, we can play golf anywhere, he said. There's an oyster catcher scolding, do you hear? And how silly to whack a little white ball. Ringed plover, but what's that calling as well? When you can spend the day like this. Oh, don't let us go and bathe yet. I just want to wander along the edge of the marsh. There's a company of turnstones. They make a noise like the drawing of a cork. There they are, those little chaps with chestnut-colored patches. Let's go along the near edge of the marsh and come out by the house where the man you say lives. We took, therefore, the path with the longer detour which I'd abandoned last night. I had said nothing to him of what the hotel porter had told me that the house was unlived in, and all he knew was that I'd seen a man, apparently in occupation there. My reason for not doing so, to make the confession at once, was that I'd already believed that the steps I'd heard inside and the man I'd seen watching outside did not imply the porter's sense of the word that the house was occupied, and I'd wondered to see whether Jack as well as myself would be conscious of any such tokens of presence there. And then the oddest thing happened. All the way up to the house, his attention was alert on the birds, and in a special on a piping note which was unfamiliar to him. In vain he tried to catch sight of the bird that uttered it, and in vain I tried to hear it. Doesn't sound like any bird I know, he said. In fact, it doesn't sound like a bird at all, but like some human being whistling. There it is again. Is it possible you don't hear it? We were now quite close to the house. There must be someone there who's whistling, he said. It must be the man that you saw. Lord, yes, it comes from inside the house. So that's explained, and I hoped it was some new bird. But why can't you hear it? Some people can't hear a bat's squeak, said I. Jack, satisfied with the explanation, took no more interest in the matter, and we struck across the shingle, bathed and lunched, and tramped on the tumble of sand dunes in which the point ended. For a couple of hours we strolled and lazed there in the liquid and sunny air, and reluctantly returned in order to cross the ford before the tide came in. As we retraced our way, I saw coming up the west a huge continent of a cloud, and just as we reached the spit of land which the house stood, a jagged sword of lightning flickered down the low-lying hills across the estuary, and a few big raindrops plopped on the shingle. We're in for a drenching, he said. Ha! Let's ask for shelter at the man's house. Better run for it. Already the big drops were falling thickly, and we scuttled across the hundred yards that lay between us and the house, and came to the door just as the sluices of heaven were pulled wide. He rapped on it, but there came no answer. He tried the handle of it, but the door did not yield, and then, by a sudden inspiration, he felt along the top of the lintel and found a key. It fitted into the wards, and the next moment we stood within. We found ourselves in a slip of a passage, at the end of which we went up the staircase to the floor above. On each side of it was a room, one a kitchen, the other a living room, but in neither was there any stick of furniture. 
Discolored paper was peeling off the walls. The windows were thick with spidery weavings. The air heavy with unventilated damp. The man that you saw dispenses with the necessities as well as the luxuries of life, said Jack. A Spartan fellow. We were standing in the kitchen outside of the hiss of rain that had grown to a roar, and the bleedered window was suddenly lit up with a flare of lightning. A crack of thunder answered it, and in the silence that followed, there came from just outside an audible now to me, the sound of a piping whistle. Immediately afterward, I heard the door by which we just entered violently banged, and I remembered that I'd left it open. His eyes met mine. But there's no breath of wind, I said. What made it bang like that? And that was no bird that whistled, said he. There was a shuffle in the passage outside of a limping step. I could hear the drag of a man's foot along the boards. He's come in said Jack. Yes, he had come in. And who would come in? At that moment, not fright, but fear, which is a very different matter, closed in on me. Fright, as I understand it, is an emotion, startling but not unnerving. You may, under the finger of fright, spring aside. You may scream. You may shout. You have the command of your muscles. But as that limping step moved down the passage, I felt fear, the hand of the nightmare that as it clutches, paralyzes, and inhibits not action only, but thought. I waited frozen and speechless for what should happen next. Exactly opposite the door of the kitchen in which we stood, the step stopped. And then, soundlessly and invisibly, the presence that had made itself manifest to the outward ear entered. Suddenly I heard Jack's breath rattle in his throat. Oh my God, he cried in a voice hoarse and strangled, and he threw his left arm across his face as if defending himself, and his fingers crooked themselves as if clutching at that which he'd evaded his blow. His body was bent back as if resisting some invisible pressure, then lunged forward again, and I heard the noise of a resisting joint and saw on his throat the shadow, or so it seemed, of a clutching hand. At that point, some power of movement came back to me, and I remember hurling myself at the empty space between him and me, and felt under my grip the shape of a shoulder and a head on the boards of the floor of the slip and scoop of a foot. Something invisible, now a shoulder, now an arm, struggled in my grasp, and I heard a panting respiration that was not Jack's nor mine, and now... Then, in my face, I felt a hot breath that stank of corruption and decay. And all this time, this physical contention was symbolical only. What he and I wrestled with was not a thing of flesh and blood, but some awful spiritual presence. And then, there was nothing. The ghostly invasion ceased as suddenly as it had begun, and there was Jack's face gleaming with sweat close to mine as we stood with dropped arms opposite each other in an empty room. With the rain beating on the roof and the gutters chuckling, no words passed between us. But the next moment, we were out in the pelting rain, running for the ford. The deluge was sweet to my soul. It seemed to wash away that horror of great darkness and that odor of corruption in which we had been plunged. Now, I have no certain explanation to give of the experience which has here been shortly recounted, and the reader may or may not connect with it a story that I heard a week or two later on my return to London. A friend of mine had been dining at my house one evening, and we had discussed a murder trial then going on of which the papers were full. It isn't only the atrocity that matters, he said. I think it is the place where the murder occurs that is the cause of the interest in it. A murder at Brighton, or Margate, or Ramsgate, any place with the public associates with pleasure trips attracts them because they know the place and can visualize the scene. But when there's a murder at some small, unknown spot which they've never heard of, there is no appeal to their imagination. Last spring, for instance, there was the murder at that small village at the coast of Norfolk. 
I've forgotten the name of the place, though I was in Norwich at the time of the trial and was present in court. It was one of the most awful stories I ever heard, as ghastly and sensational as this last affair, but it didn't attract the smallest attention. Odd that I can't remember the name of that place when all the rest is so vivid to me. Tell me about it, I said. I never heard of it. Well, there was this little village, and just outside it was a farm owned by a man called John Beardsley. He lived there with his only daughter, an unmarried woman of about thirty, and good-looking, sensible creature, apparently, the last in the world you would have thought to do anything unexpected. There worked at the farm as a day laborer, and a young fellow called Alfred Malden, who, in the trial which I am speaking, was the prisoner. He had one of the most dreadful faces I ever saw. A cat-like receding forehead, a broad, short nose, and a great red sensual mouth always on the grin. He seemed positively to enjoy being at the central figure around whom all the interest of these ghoulish women who thronged the court was concentrated, and when he shambled into the witness box... Shambled? I asked. Yes. His left foot dragged along the floor as he walked. As he shambled to the witness box, he nodded and smiled to the judge and clapped his counsel on the shoulder and leered at the gallery. He worked on the farm, and I was saying, doing jobs that were within his capacity, among which was certain housework, carrying coals and whatnot, for John Beardsley, though, very well off, kept no servant, and this daughter Alice, that was her name, ran the house. And what must she do but fall in love? It was no less than that with this monstrous and misshapen fellow. One afternoon, her father came home unexpectedly and caught them together in the parlor, kissing and cuddling. He turned the man out of the house, neck and crop, gave him a week's wages and dismissed him, threatening him with a fine thrashing if he ever caught him hanging about the place. He forbade his daughter ever to speak to him again, and in order to keep watch over her, got in a woman from the village who could be there all day while he was out on the farm. Young Malden, deprived of his job, tried to get work in the village, but none would employ him, for he was an ill-tempered fellow, ready to pick a quarrel with anyone, and, despite his limp, he had immense muscular strength. For some weeks he idled about in the village, getting a chance job occasionally, and no doubt, as you will see, Alice Beardsley managed to meet him. The village, its name still escapes me, lay on the edge of a big tidal estuary, full at high water, but on the ebb of a broad stretch of marsh and sand and mud banks, beyond which ran a long belt of shingle that formed the seaweed side of the estuary. On it stood a disused coast guard house, a couple of miles away from the village, and in as lonely a place as you would find anywhere in England. At low tide, there was a shallow ford across to it, and in the sandbanks round about, it some bed of cockle. Malden, unable to get regular work, took to cockle digging, and during the summer, when the tide was low, Alice, it was no new thing to her, used to go over to the ford of the beach beyond and bathe. She would go across the sandbanks where the cockle diggers, Malden among them, were at work, and if he whistled as she passed, that was a signal between them that he would slip away presently and join her at the disused Coast Guard house, and there throughout the summer they used to meet. As the weeks went on, her father saw the change that was coming in her, and suspecting the cause, often left his work and hidden behind some sea bank, used to watch her. One day he saw her cross the ford, and soon after she'd passed, he saw Malden, recognizable from a long off way by dragging his leg to follow her. He went up the path to the Coast Guard house and entered. At that, John Beardsley crossed the ford and, hiding into the bushes near the house, saw Alice coming back from her bathe. The house was off in the direct path to the ford, but she went round from that way, and the door was open to her and closed behind her. He found them together and, mad with rage, attacked the man. They fought and Malden got him down and then, in front of his daughter, strangled him. The girl went off her head and is in the asylum at Norwich now. She sits all day by the window whistling. The man was hanged. Was Riddington the name of the village? I asked. 
Yes, Reddington, of course, he said. I can't think of how I forgot. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed tonight's stories. I know the public domain is something we don't do here often, but I stumbled across these two and I thought they would be really fun to read. I think my favorite from tonight is probably the first one, though the second one was really good as well. Written by the same person. Pretty easy for me to get through. Uh, Public domain can be kind of challenging at times. It was just a different way of talking, different way of writing back then. Something I have to get used to if I want to continue doing these, but I had a lot of fun reading these tonight, and I hope you had fun listening as well. If you did, let me know in the comment section below which one was your favorite. And while you're down there, be sure to leave me a suggestion for other authors or other stories in the public domain that you would be interested in hearing. While you're doing that, I'm going to go ahead and give a quick thank you to all of our $5 patrons and members. Thank you to Absent Alice, Amethyst Demet, Anne Barry, Bubbly Panda, Caroline, Christina Smith, CT, Deborah Tychus, Elizabeth Watkins, Alice G., Frankie Brockway, Furious Weasel, If in Doubt, Flat Out, Jennifer Dameron, Jesse Jess Jess, Justinia Zaromsky, Karen Parrott, Kat, Kathy Fanning, Laura, Lindsay Pruitt, Melody Evans, Melissa Berwick, Mindy Bannon, Moon Potato, Nicholas Moore, Nora Nova Nocturne, Patricia Rodea, PJ Masks, Ray Clegg, Sentinel, The New On Gum 24, Tiger Princess, Tish Love, Triumph, and finally, Victoria Step. Thank you all for the amazing continued support. Thank you to everyone who stops by and listens to the video leaves a nice comment. I really, really do appreciate all of you. Hope you all have a wonderful day, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. Hope you sleep well. Hope your life's going great. And as always, take care out there.